Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. We are glad to have you here with us this morning, whether you are joining us online via Facebook or whether you are joining us here in the building. Either way, we're glad to have you here. We'd like to invite you to uh, use the connection card on our website at firstpresbyterian.church to connect with us and ask us any questions you may have or let us know if you're new with us today or new-ish. Uh, also, if you are watching on Facebook, you can drop a line in the comments section and, uh, and connect with us in that way and let us know that you're here and worshiping with us this morning. October in uh, many Presbyterian churches is a season where we celebrate and remember our Reformed Presbyterian heritage that goes back for over 500 years. We're going to have a big celebration at the end of the month, our Reformation Sunday, but throughout this month you'll still hear us include some traditional uh, prayers from our, our heritage and our history, some songs and, and uh, other things like that. In the earliest days of Presbyterianism, the only songs that were sung as part of worship were the Psalms. And so today, we're going to do that. Our first two songs are going to be from the Psalms, Psalm 1 and Psalm 4. The words or the versification of these Psalms was actually taken from the old 1927 Psalter hymnal of the Presbyterian Church. Uh, we took those words and we modernized the music and so we're going to sing those for you today. We'll put the words on the screen so that you can sing along with us. Blessed is she, blessed is she who makes the statutes of her Lord, her chief delight in God's law, divinely perfect, meditating day and night. She is like a tree. Like the driven chaff, like the driven chaff, the wicked shall be swept from off the land. With the just they shall not gather, nor shall in the judgment stand. Let us be like trees, well. Last verse, sing it with us. Well, the Lord will guard the righteous, for their way to him is known. But the way of evil to us shall by him be overthrown. Let us be like. 
prayer today was written by John Knox, the 16th century reformer and founder of the Presbyterian movement in Scotland. Let his words be our own this morning as we pray. O Lord, strengthen our faith. Kindle it more in ferventness and love towards you and our neighbors for your sake. Most dear Father, do not let us receive your word in vain, but grant us the assistance of your grace and Holy Spirit, that in heart word, and deed, we may sanctify and worship your name. Amen. Anxious and despairing, many walk in the night, but to those that fear him, God will send his light. In God's love of in God's love of I have joy and peace for them all who wicked, though their wealth increase. In his care confiding, I will sweetly sleep for the In his care confiding, I will sweetly sleep, for the Lord my Savior will in safety keep, for the Lord my Savior. Thank you. 
time for another parable. Sometimes people wonder what's really inside a parable. So here's a parable that shows you that. Now, it's not a parable of Jesus. It's not gold like the other parables we've shown you. It's smaller and a different color. So all we have to do is take off the lid to see what's really inside a parable. But be careful. You have to be really ready to do this. It's another box. Okay, so a box in the box. Okay, a parable inside a parable. So this must be where we find out what's really inside of a parable. Another box. Okay, this is where we're going to find out. Another box. Okay, I get it. A parable inside a parable. Like a box inside of a box. So we don't need any more boxes. We already know a parable inside a parable. Like a box inside a box. So we don't need any more. Let's see what's, what's it really in there. Another box. All right. So maybe... It's a bunch of boxes inside of other boxes. Yep, there's another one. And another one. Okay, so this one must be the last one. I'm sure they don't make boxes much smaller than this. <gasps> There's another box, but this time it's gold. This has to be what we were looking for. So let's find out what's really inside a parable. It's kind of hard to see, isn't it? This is why people put parables inside of boxes. Because they're very precious and they don't want to lose them. And so the next person who had this box decided that they liked parables so much that this box wasn't quite right. So they made their own box and they put their own box. They put their parable inside their own box. And the next people decided they needed to make their own box. And then the next people decided that that box wasn't quite right. So they made their own box. And people kept making their own boxes. They made the boxes that were just right for them. And this went on for hundreds of years. People made the boxes that were right for them for the parable. And they kept making them and this went on and on. And after a thousand years, it was still going on. Then, about the time that America was being discovered, it was still going on. People were still making their own boxes that were right for them. And then it came to the time of your grandparents. And they decided that the box that somebody made before them wasn't quite right. So they made their own box. When it was time when it was the time of your mom and dad 
they decided that they too needed to make their own box. A box that was just right for them. I wonder who's going to make the next box. I wonder what this box could really be. I wonder what kind of box you're going to make. I'd like to share some announcements with you now about things that are happening in the life of our church and ways in which you can participate. Tomorrow is Columbus Day, or as some people have referred to it, Indigenous Peoples Day. Whatever you call it, it's a holiday, and so tomorrow our church offices will be closed. Later on this week, Thursday evening, is our Wave of Light service. This is a service of remembrance for those who have lost children during pregnancy, infancy, childhood, or even adulthood. And so we are going to gather outside uh, underneath the bell tower in the area of the prayer labyrinth. We'll gather outside at 6.30 p.m. And then at 7 o'clock, we will light candles of remembrance along with people in our community, in our country, and in our world who are participating in this event. So that's Thursday night uh, at 6.30. On October 25th is one of our favorite events of the year, Reformation Sunday. Um, it's a Sunday where we celebrate and remember our Reformed Presbyterian and Scottish heritage. And so we're going to do that this year. And uh, this is something that we will certainly broadcast online to Facebook, but we would actually love to invite you to come in person. Uh, we have a big enough sanctuary that everyone can spread out. You can wear your face mask, and I think we'll be safe. We'd love to invite you to come back to the sanctuary for, especially for our Reformation Sunday worship service. Thank you. We are going to have the Empire Pipes and Drums uh, bagpipe band uh, here, and they will lead us in some traditional um, music, bagpipe music, uh, the sermon and the prayers and the liturgies for that day will all be things that feature and remind us of our heritage as Presbyterians. Also on that day, um, we are going to collect all of the coats that have been donated through our preschool, our elementary school, and anyone else. We're going to collect those coats and we are going to bring them up to the front and say a prayer of blessing over them before we send them to their intended recipients in our sister city of Juarez. If you would like to donate a new or gently used children's coat, we would love for you to do that. You can either come and hang them on the fence here during the week or just bring them into the church office. We also have finally figured out what we're doing instead of trunk or treat this year. We reviewed all of the city guidelines, uh, all of the CDC guidelines, and uh, figured out what we can do to be safe and responsible, but still allow our kids and our community to have uh, something meaningful on October 31st. So we are going to do an enchanted forest. It's kind of like trunk or treat, but it's kind of different. In the past, we would line up cars that would be decorated and the kids would wear their costumes and go from trunk to trunk uh, and we would pass out candy. Um, this time, we're still needing cars, but you're going to provide your car and decorate it as a tree trunk. Get it? Tree trunk, trunk, all right? So we'll have cars, a row of cars on each side, and it will be an enchanted forest. The, student, uh, the children can wear their costumes and come through one family at a time. Uh, instead of passing out candy from the individual trunks, there will be a station at the end uh, where we, the church, will hand out individually wrapped packages of candy. All of this uh, follows CDC and city recommendations and guidelines, so it's a costume parade through an enchanted forest with uh, a candy distribution at the very end. We still need people to decorate their cars as tree trunks and trees in our enchanted forest, and if you'd like to do that, please contact our church office and let us know, either via email or through the website contact form or even in the comments on Facebook. That will be 2 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. on Saturday, October 31st. 
want to continue to thank everyone for the financial contributions that you continue to make that support the ministries of First Presbyterian Church and our outreach programs into our community. Uh, there are different ways in which you can give to support those ministries. One is through our church website, firstpresbyterian.church, which has instructions for online giving. The second is through the Venmo smartphone app, and of course, if you're here in the building, you can place donations in the offering plates that are at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, if you're watching online, we still receive and accept gifts made through U.S. Postal Service, check uh, via mail. But however you choose to give, know that we are profoundly grateful for the gifts that keep us going. We want to wish a happy birthday to those celebrating birthdays this week. Paul Ocon, Angel Garcia, Michelle Gutierrez, Ashley Taylor, Dalton Caldwell, Hayden Navarrete, Georgia Carrion Thompson. If you know any of these folks, please pick up the phone and give them a call or send them a message. Either way, let them know how much we appreciate them being part of our faith community here at First Presbyterian Church. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25 verses 31 through 46. If you have a Bible handy, feel free to look up that passage and follow along with us. If you have a smartphone, you can use that to do a Google search on Matthew 25, 31 through 46 and follow along with us in that way. This is the parable of the sheep and the goats. So this is Jesus talking to his followers and he says to them in Matthew 25, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep at His right hand and the goats at the left. Then the King will say to those at His right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, so you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer to them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is the parable of the sheep and the goats, and so that means I can't possibly resist the opportunity to tell a good sheep joke. 
a devout cowboy, we'll call him Jim, lost his favorite Bible while he was out mending fences on the range. And yet three weeks later, a sheep, a lone sheep, walked up to him, and behold, the sheep was carrying Jim's Bible in its mouth. Well, Jim couldn't believe his eyes. He took the precious book out of the sheep's mouth, raised his eyes to heaven, and exclaimed, It's a miracle, Lord! At this, the sheep replied, Well, it's not really a miracle, Jim. I mean, your name is written inside the cover. Growing up, my dad and my mom had two very different ways of organizing things. My dad would divide everything into categories, organize them by color, size, shape, and purpose. Everything had a special home, and everything lived in its home. My mom, on the other hand, would gather everything all into one big pile, and then she would put the pile somewhere, like in the closet or in a drawer or on top of her desk. My dad was a divider. My mom was a piler. Which one are you? Now, the fact that I've just divided my parents into two distinct categories and placed each one in their respective places, that should probably clue you in to which one I am. I am married to a piler. My eldest son is a piler who's trying really hard to be a divider. My daughter is a piler, and my youngest son, well, he's a drummer. That's an entirely different category for some other day. But dividers and pilers, which one is God? To read today's parable from Matthew, you would think that God is a divider, dividing left hand from right hand, sheep from goats, blessed from cursed, eternal life from eternal fire. But elsewhere in the Gospels, we read that Jesus is the good shepherd, the one who brings the lost sheep back into the fold, definitely a piler move. How do we reconcile these two images of God? We probably want God to be a piler when we think of God being inclusive and including everybody until somebody gets added to the pile who we think doesn't belong. If you want an example of that, think of your least favorite presidential candidate right now. Is that someone you want in the pile with you? Or maybe we want God to be a divider and judge people we feel like need to be judged, but only if we ourselves end up on the right side of the divide. And that's a problem. Actually, there are a number of problems that arise in today's parable. And I have divided them into three separate categories. Problems of interpretation, problems of translation, and problems of doctrine or teaching. We'll start with interpretation problems. And by this, I mean literal interpretation versus figurative interpretation. Is Jesus using a metaphor in this passage, or is he speaking literally? Now, I don't know anyone who thinks that he's talking about real sheep and goats here. That's an obvious metaphor. And yet many people seem to think that the part about eternal life and eternal fire is quite literal. Does that mean Jesus is jumping back and forth in the parable between literal and figurative? Because that would be very unlike his typical approach that we've already seen in his parables. On the other hand, if the whole thing is one big metaphor, sheep, goats, eternal life, eternal fire, then what does it represent? And who are we in the parable? I actually did a little bit of research for today's parable, not the biblical kind of research, but the farmer kind of research. I wanted to learn more about sheep and goats. Mostly, I wanted to know why would a shepherd separate his sheep from his goats. And it turns out there's actually a pretty good reason for that. It's because they don't get along well together. The goats are more aggressive and tend to dominate the sheep when you put them in close quarters. Now, conventional wisdom for this parable is that the sheep 
are supposed to represent obedient followers of Christ and therefore good, while the goats represent independent and strong-willed, stubborn people who refuse to follow and therefore bad. I've heard lots of sermons that take this approach. Be a good sheep and follow Jesus. Don't be a stubborn goat. But I've got a problem with that interpretation. Because there are a lot of places in the Old Testament and the New Testament where God's people are called sheep as an insult, as in stupid sheep who followed the wrong shepherd or stupid sheep who do what all the other sheep do. Today we call those sheeple, right? Conversely, how many of the great biblical heroes of the faith could we label as independent and strong-willed? People like Moses, David, the Apostle Paul, even Jesus himself. And sometimes their stubbornness got them in big trouble, but God used every single one of them to accomplish great good in the world. So I think it's safe to say that being like a sheep can be either good or bad, and being like a goat can be either good or bad. Another problem I have with this sheep and goat metaphor. Let's say that you are the good shepherd, and you have just finished dividing your sheep from your goats, which, as we've said, is probably a good idea. What do you do with them now? Well, according to the parable, you burn all your goats to a crisp because they're bad. Really, no self-respecting shepherd would divide his flock only to kill half of it. The goats are valuable to the shepherd, too. Which brings me to another problem I have with this metaphor. Why is it that sheep and goats are both valuable to the shepherd? Well, regardless of which one you are, the shepherd, the good shepherd, may lead you beside the still waters for a few months, but after that, it's off to the marketplace where he sells you for profit so that you can be eaten for dinner regardless of how good or bad you were. Metaphors can only take us so far. Moving on to problems in translation. Verse 32 of this passage reads, All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Only in the original Greek language of the New Testament, that word people isn't there. There is nothing in this verse about separating individual people from one another. Instead, the King James translation gets it right here. It says, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. Them, as in the nations, or in Greek, ethne, which means the ethnic groups or the tribes of people. So you are judged not by your own individual actions, but by the collective actions of all the people you are associated with. Think your country, your community, your extended family. How do you feel about being judged on that basis? The next translation issue is with the very words for sheep and goat themselves. Probata in Greek and eriphon. Now, probata, which is the word that gets translated as sheep, probata, according to Strong's Dictionary of Biblical Greek, is any four-footed tame animal accustomed to graze, most commonly a sheep or a goat. Uh-oh. The word we're using for sheep could also mean goat. Well, what about the word for goat then? Eriphon, the word translated as goat in this passage, comes from the word erion, which means little and hairy. So Jesus is actually separating the sheep or maybe the goats from the little hairy creatures. And now we're really in trouble. But all of these problems are minor compared to the huge problem that this parable raises to basic Christian doctrine and teaching 
for the past 500 years since the Reformation. Most Protestant churches, including this one, teach that you cannot earn your way into heaven. Salvation has nothing to do with good works or good deeds, but comes instead from faith, from believing or professing that Jesus is Lord. And yet, what is Jesus saying in this parable? He says, come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you because I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Later on, he says, depart from me into eternal fire because I was hungry and you did not feed me and so on and so forth. In Greek, just like in English, the preposition for or because almost always implies cause and effect. So Jesus is pretty clearly saying here that you are in or you are out, not based on what you believed, but based on what you did or what your country did, how you treated other people. So much for the Reformation and the entire doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. What a mess. There are so many problems in this parable. But are there any solutions? Well, I told you at the beginning of the sermon that I am a divider. And I've been looking at this parable through the eyes of a divider, categorizing and separating and isolating and putting things in their proper places. But when I look at this parable through the eyes of a piler, I see something entirely different. Different from the way it's usually understood, but also far more compelling. Take the metaphor of the sheep and the goats, for example. I said that it would be a good idea for the shepherd to divide them from one another, but it turns out that if we're talking about real sheep and real goats here, you don't have to do that because they divide themselves. Sheep prefer the flock, and though some wander and stray away, they also tend to freak out when they are alone. Goats, on the other hand, prefer their independence and will avoid the sheep at all costs unless they are penned together in close quarters. Goats divide themselves, but a good shepherd will still shepherd both the sheep and the goats in different ways according to their needs and their nature. The sheep are shepherded actively and presently. The goats are shepherded passively by giving them space. Those of us who are like sheep, fear being divided from our flock, being all alone. Those of us who are more like goats, fear losing our independence, being forced into a group we're not sure we really belong in. And so we divide ourselves. But God, the good shepherd, the piler and not the divider, God guides the entire flock, all of humanity, each of us according to our need our disposition, and our personality. All right, what about translation issues then? Are these sheep, goats, or little hairy creatures, or what? Again, if we look with the eyes of a divider, they have to be different for the story to make sense, almost opposite extremes, sheep, goats, good, bad, saved, condemned. But I think the ambiguity of the language that Jesus uses in the Greek text, that ambiguity might be intentional. Because the things on either side of this divide are pretty much kind of the same thing. Yes, some are ultimately rewarded and some are ultimately punished. But there's not as much difference between them as we might expect. We are all sinners and we are all saints depending on the time of day, the weather, and the person driving in front of you in traffic. No matter what side we ultimately end up on, it's always good to remember that we are far more alike than we are different. What about the problems of doctrine and teaching? Are we saved by grace 
or by doing good works. Again, that's a way of dividing. And maybe that age-old argument misses the point in the end. Looking at those who fed the hungry in the story and those who did not feed the hungry in the story, perhaps we should ask the question, in what ways are they all in the same pile? And I think it's this. They're all surprised. One side is surprised to be told that they have not been feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and all of those things. And probably they are surprised because they genuinely thought that they were doing those things. Likewise, the other group genuinely thought they were not doing any of those things, and so they were surprised to be told that they had been. Jesus often says that the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. First, last. Those words sound like they separate, divide, and judge. But those words also imply something else. They imply that everyone is standing in the same line, some in front, some in back. But they imply that everyone is moving in the same direction towards the same objective. Some get there first, some get there last, but everyone who chooses to stand in the line eventually gets there. So, is God a divider or a piler? Am I a sheep or a goat? I think my current answer to all of those questions is yes, yes. And whichever one you are, whichever eyes you see the world through, it might be helpful occasionally to look at things the other way around. In any case, it should be a comfort to know that the one who judges us and divides us is also the one who unites us and calls us together. That's a paradox, and I suspect I will never fully understand how it works, but that's okay, because here at First Presbyterian Church, we often say that we are a church for wanderers, wanderers, and wisdom seekers. And so we wonder about things like this as we wander off or wander back in on our life journeys, according to our sheepish or goatish tendencies. And we seek wisdom by asking the difficult questions. But we also know that wisdom is forged in humility. And we realize that there is not always a perfect solution to every problem. There's not always a perfect answer to every difficult theological or life question. So in the meantime, keep wondering, keep wandering, and may the wisdom of the parables, the wisdom of the Good Shepherd, always be your guide. Let us pray. Lord, you have brought each one of us into this world and you have told us in your scriptures that we are all precious in your sight. And yet sometimes, Lord, we have an inclination to judge those around us, to stereotype those around us, to pile together or divide apart in ways that both can be harmful and keep us from understanding your love and your purpose. For us in this world. Help us to reach across those divides. Help us to break down those barriers between ourselves and our neighbors and the people in our world and in our community. Help us work with those around us to accomplish the good, to help each other in the way that you have called us to, and most of all, to show the same love that you have shown to us. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. God is my 
Let us now say together what we believe using the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Closing hymn today is number 275, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. This is one of the great anthems of the Reformation. Let us sing it now together. The words will be on the screens for you to sing along. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never fails. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal hills prevailing, for still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe, his craft and power our Did we in our own 
man of God's own choosing, just as cool that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord, stop Now let us say together our prayer of confession. This is a special prayer of confession from 1539 used by both John Calvin and John Knox in their own worship services. Let us say the words printed on the screen together. Almighty God, eternal Father, we acknowledge and confess to you that we were born in unrighteousness. Our life is full of sin and transgression. We have not gladly believed your word, nor followed your holy commandments. For your goodness sake and for your name's sake, be gracious unto us, we pray, and forgive us all our sin, which is very great. Amen. Hear the good news. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and gave himself for us so that we might know a better way to live and we might have that life abundantly we are forgiven and we may be at peace and now as you go may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you may the lord lift up his countenance upon each and every one of you and grant you peace amen go in peace mm -hmm.